Welcome to Successful Parenting, where we, Jackie Rue and Robin Choquette, share practical skills for families to build resilience and healthy connections. As practicing professionals and parents ourselves, we hope this podcast is a resource for parents to grow, reflect, and learn more about themselves and their children. Our approach is simple, tangible, and most importantly, we lead with compassion for the integrity of the families we serve. This podcast should not be taken as medical advice and is intended for informational purposes only. We love our work and we can't wait to watch families gain confidence and open themselves up to new ways of successful parenting. Good afternoon, Robin. Hey, Jackie. How are you today? I am doing good. 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 Hey, I wanted to check in with you. I know you had an injury. How are things going? They are, they're slowly, slowly moving. I like to run and I like to, uh, to work out. And unfortunately I'm not getting younger. And I think earlier this year in March, I had, I had a little bit of an injury that, uh, because I, I kept going and did not slow down evolved into me, uh, being in a boot for a few weeks. And so it is in a nice way, it is, is getting better and it is, we are hoping that in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be returning back to running a little bit. I get to start at a half mile, which will be super fun. And it's, <laughs> it's actually, you know, I've learned a lot about myself in this whole process. You know, a big part of my, my life is working out and working out with friends and things like that. And so I've really had to learn to kind of manage my stress and my activity in a different way. Mm-hmm. And it's allowed me to really explore different opportunities. So I think overall, while it hasn't been easy, it's been a learning experience, and I hope in the next couple of weeks to be able to report that I am slowly back to running. Great. I know it's been difficult. And as you said, you know, you've talked about just that reflecting and pausing. And, and I think that's what it's given you that opportunity. And I think intuitively, we will do that if we pause but it's getting us to pause in life, right? Well, I think sometimes there can be some guilt and shame with injury, you know, and I I think sometimes interesting it is, it is, you know, there can be some self-blame when you get injured and you feel like you've done something wrong. And I've learned it's our body's way of telling us we need a break. And I think as long as it's, it's done in the proper way, it can be a good time to just take a pause. I am excited for this conversation today. Jackie, we have Dr. Max Tyranny with us. He is a professor of psychology. He's a sports psychologist, clinical neuropsychologist. He is at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And I met Max, I don't know how many years ago. It was really interesting. So I wanted to participate and gain knowledge and just a better foundation in the world of performance psych. And I found this group, a consultation group that would meet once a month. And these individuals were from all over the US plus Canada. Max is talking about working with coaches. And this was a particular time where we were just discussing how to connect with coaches, be more collaborative. And Max starts talking about a particular coach that he really enjoys working with and was giving some examples but it started to sound very familiar of someone that I know. I eventually asked him the name, my son-in-law. Max is just an amazing person. He is so welcoming, is always there. If you have a question, always there to answer anything that you need. You're going to really love this, Jackie. I think our listeners are really going to enjoy this time with Max. Hello, Dr. Max. Hi. Wow. Thank you (laughs) for the kind words. You are welcome. They are all true. Everyone speaks very highly of you. Oh, thank you. Tell us a little bit about your background. You know, what does an average day look like for you? Yeah. On a typical day, I'll be in our neuropsychology lab and we'll be evaluating patients who have come with some kind of change in their cognition, whether it's memory or something else. And they've been referred by my physician colleagues uh, all over the institution for one reason or another. So I usually see several patients like that in a day. And then I usually have, on many days, sports psychology clients that are coming because they've had an injury and they're recovering, because they have some degree of performance anxiety uh, or some difficulty adapting to their sports situation. And these might be adults, they might be youngsters, with or without their parents. Yesterday, 
a young woman said that her mom could wait in the waiting room. Okay. <laughs> Other days, I've had a young guy and his dad in the room, and that's that's common as well. Now, you have not only your professional, but you work in you know the sports area, in particular soccer, coaching. You've played sports yourself. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, these days I'm not coaching. Okay. I guess the work and the home life have filled that space pretty well. I'm not sure how I got the coaching in all the time, actually. <laughs> I, uh, I wrestled in high school and started playing soccer. I came to the game late, as they say, and then played uh, soccer in, in leagues around here and pickup games and started coaching when my kids started playing soccer and went on obtain my coaching licenses or diplomas. The coaching parenting process was pretty interesting and uh, had my share of chagrin and learned a lot <laughs> along the way. And uh, later on, I started running distance, you know, uh, 5Ks, marathons like, like you. And these days, not so much that, but I try and get myself under a barbell once in a while to maintain some strength. Tell us about what you do in the world of sports psychology. Yeah, so uh, I, I get referrals from colleagues uh, in our health system, and, and sometimes uh, parents will find me and, and get a referral into me. So I'll see clients, uh, as I was saying, who have had an injury, and it's very common to see uh, a young athlete who's had uh, an ACL tear, uh, anterior cruciate ligament tear that needs repairing or has been repaired. Uh, They're having difficulty adapting to it psychologically, emotionally, and struggling with how to think of themselves. So I'll work with them to help them through that. Uh, And uh, and others have some good old-fashioned performance anxiety. They feel unsure of themselves, and they may have uh, played their game or been in competitions before, but for whatever reason, They are apprehensive when they go out on the pitch or the court or the hockey rink, and they feel like they're just not performing because they're, for lack of better words, wound up, anxious, uh, in their head, as they say. Yeah. You know, we work a lot with parents, too, of athletes, and I'm sure you do, too, and it, it is so much about the pressure we put, you know, ourselves as well as our children. Do you see that? Do you work a lot with athletes and their parents or mostly just the athletes? Yeah, it's some of both. And it depends a bit on the age uh, of, of the youngster. A lot of times when they're pretty young, I'll let the referral source know and I'll let, uh, let the parents know, well, we're, we're dealing with the environment here. We're going to try and work on the environment. And as, as you suggest, there's pressure on the young athlete uh, many times, which is unintended. People don't mean to put pressure right. on. It's a bit of a pithy phrase, I suppose, but I sometimes suggest that pride equals pressure. And it's it's one thing to have expectations and belief in the youngster. It's another thing to have so much pride that that the youngster starts to feel the pressure and worry whether or not they're measuring up. Mm -hmm. Well, and since the pandemic, something I've run across a lot, Dr. Max, is, you know, I've had many athletes that displaying disordered signs of eating, um, eating disorders, nutrition, and and families have a really hard time pausing on the sport or pausing on the exercise, especially if and some of my high school kids are en route for like D1 and things like that. Really, you know, we talk a lot about when, you know, our children, our, our teens, ourselves, and I can relate to this, when we really struggle with stress and anxiety, we're not properly giving our body enough nutrition, we're more prone to injury because our bodies are tight, tired. And I talk a lot about that with parents and, and that nutrition piece of, of sometimes that sport might need to take a back seat while we're really focusing on the overall physical, mental, and emotional health, right? Yeah, I agree. And I do see some clients who have or have had eating disorders, and these are typically young women, and uh, or will consult on a case where an eating disorder is present in uh, a colleague's client, and, and I'll consult because that, that client is an athlete. That eating disorder, if it's a true eating disorder, and as you say, even if it's disordered eating, we have to pay attention to it. Other things need to take a back seat. We have to make sure that person is physically healthy, or if there are 
concerns that their pediatrician or family doctor finds, those have to be addressed. Uh, oh, it, yeah. it does not have to be full-blown diagnosable anorexia nervosa or bulimia uh, because we know that eating disorders that are, as they say, not otherwise specified have the same morbidity and even mortality associated with them as the clear diagnosable uh, eating disorder. So we really have to pay attention to that. Yeah, 100%. And beyond that, yeah, we have to pay attention to nutrition. Are there enough calories and are they the right kind of calories to fuel uh, a young growing body? And hey, I wrestled. I cut weight. <laughs> I, I, I probably shouldn't have, but I did. Because you really want to make your weight class. Yeah. And in high school, you see a lot of those wrestlers also or football players. And there is a lot of that yo-yoing going back and forth. Yeah. And I've seen that a lot with uh, young men. Yeah. It's it's hard on them. And I I think that the overall culture is is somewhat better than what I had seen in the past. But it still happens. And uh, if if a consequence is showing up because of that kind of eating, it, it needs to be addressed. And uh, typically, I think a physician colleague needs to be involved to make sure we're not missing something. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And for us, we partner with a dietitian who specializes in that. And, and we bring her in early on with, with mm-hmm. a lot of our athletes overall, you know, even if we see signs, but we, we find it important really to be working on that nutrition piece, because so often, you know, that's not discussed. And a lot of the high school kids, even I notice, you know, they're in school all day, and they go right to their sport after and, and they're getting home or six or seven. And no one's really talking about that important, you know, part of like incorporating those snacks throughout the day, having snacks at practice. And I think we don't always take a look at that. And I think this is just such a great conversation. I know we, we veered off a little bit, but, but I do really think it fits in here. Yeah. yeah, We veered. I realized I I was going to say, you know, with the background that I've looked into for classic strength training, and you look at the diets that strength coaches want to put their athletes on, I'm going through this stuff and I'm learning about it. And I think, oh my gosh, can I eat that much? <laughs> <laughs> and found out if you don't, you don't improve. 100%. And, uh, you know, if you're a, a 15, 16, 17 year old athlete, you don't have that life experience and that athletic experience to fall back on. So at some point, some guidance is needed to help them get the nutrition and help them develop the habits they're going to need to carry them forward. Yes, 100%. And that's, you know, we really talk about parenting there. That's so important. Important, I think, to have that awareness of your child and, you know, the bonding that occurs with child and parent. And we know attachment and attunement are two critical pieces of that. Do you want to talk a little bit of how that plays out in the world of sports psychology and, and just working with athletes? Yeah, and I, I end up, and I think it's useful to talk with parents, maybe not all the time, but many times about where they came from and about their parenting. Because, uh, you know, it's, I guess it's trite, but we all came from somewhere. <laughs> and so we all have a parenting history. And uh, Robin, you and I were talking the other day uh, about this exercise that I do with parents sometimes, or I've done in coaching education classes or large groups of parents. You've worked with the Olympic Developmental Program, right, as well? Yeah, uh, I used I used to consult to uh, Region 2 ODP and uh, a bit to U.S. Youth Soccer and work with the young men or young women in that program. So uh, you all are familiar with that. You know, uh, 400 youngsters uh, come into camp one week and they pick 18 of them in an age group to keep over the next week to right. <laughs> to work over even more because yeah. those are the ones that they're going to take to Costa Rica and Italy or play around mm-hmm. the country and, and that sort right. of thing. They're they're the best out of the group that that they pick. Right. And so I, I get to work with some of the youngsters uh, or have worked with some of the youngsters in, in the first week. And then it's fantastic to work with uh, the teams that they select yeah. uh, or consult to coaches. It's best job ever. Yeah. Stressful for the parents as well throughout that process, right? Oh, yeah. Worried mm-hmm. about whether or not their child will be noticed and selected. And uh, our daughter went through that. And uh, I get it. And she was a goalkeeper. So I understand a little bit about stress uh, and have experienced 
that and it went she went through the ODP process and uh, played there yeah. and trained there. So yeah, and redirect me because I've, I've lost the plot yeah. a little bit. <laughs> oh, no, we totally went off. But I, you were talking about you and I were talking uh, several days ago, just about that, you know, attachment and attunement and, oh, yeah. and, you know, kind of our history, because yeah. Jackie and I, in our workbook, our parenting workbook, we talk of the same thing that you're saying, look at your history. Do you have the awareness? How does that influence you today? Yeah. When I was doing coaching education and through Minnesota Youth Soccer Association, we had a program called Parents and Coaches Together and was able to serve on uh, or in that program uh, and deliver courses uh, with a partner. And we had a, a group of us that would provide courses for soccer clubs around the state. Uh, one of the exercises we used in there came from Dr. Nicole Lavoie, who is the director of the Tucker Center for Girls and Women in Sport at the University of Minnesota. And then her mentor had been uh, Clark Power at the University of Notre, Notre Dame. So this isn't my exercise. I, <laughs> we pick things up from colleagues. So in, in groups, I would ask coaches or parents to, you know, just on a piece of scrap paper, even uh, make a circle big enough to put a few notes in and ask them to think of someone that guided them when they were younger, someone that lifted them up. And it might've been a parent. Uh, it might've been another relative, maybe a teacher or a coach. Uh, it, you know, they might even have an iconic figure from literature, a hero, maybe. And make a few notes about what that person was like, uh, words that describe them and words that describe that relationship that lifted them up and, you know, helped them believe in themselves like they could be even more. You know, they'd take a few moments to do that. And then I ask them, okay, so make a square next to that and put in the name or initials of somebody that just brought you down. After you dealt with them, you you had, were filled with self doubt and wondered if you could ever amount to anything, and didn't know if you would ever make it. And put a few words down that describe that person and what the relationship was like. Wow! And then I'd ask people to, if they had anything that they could share about the circle, you know, can you share some of the words? And that you know they would have words caring, trusting, uh, dedicated devotion, loving, uh, that, you know, would steal some from me and uh, uplifting, warm, and, and, and the list would go on. Mm -hmm. And once they got started, the pace would pick up. <laughs> um, it's a, a, great. You know, I asked them, can we go to the square? And everything would slow down. And I would remind them, don't share anything you don't want to. And they would come up with words that would just drop the temperature in the room. Wow. And so we get to that point, And one of the morals to the story is, okay, so we all have a circle and a square. Right. Everyone's been exposed. And we all carry it. And in a tight moment, and it, I, I think this is useful for parents and coaches, in a tight moment, which one comes out? You know, when you're tired and, you know, things aren't going right and that sort of thing, which one turns up and how quickly does it turn up for you? Do you find a lot of it has to do with our own self-talk? Oh, yeah. This is all part of it. Yeah. Uh, this, is, yeah. This, is, this is some of the basis for it. Right, right. You know, then the conversation in the group gets interesting. So part of this, part of the next question is, so which of these would you pass on if you could? Or if you found each of these on your path in life, so to speak, which of them would you pick up again and put in your pocket? Do you find that most have a lot of self-awareness? Like, do you get some pretty good information? Oh, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. I tell them I consider it an honor to work with them because people open up and talk about this stuff. I think find out that, again, we all have been through some of this stuff some more than others in different ways. And so I think it's, 
it helps to find out, so what am I carrying? And, and again, what would I pass on if I had my druthers, so to speak? Well, and that kind of leads to my next, we all face disappointment. And, and we talk a lot about this, even on this podcast is, you know, one of my goals when I work with families is to teach kids how to fail and how to bounce back from it, right? Because yeah. it, it's a natural, I think so often I, I work with athletes that are out there avoiding failure and, and they're avoiding, you know, making mistakes and it, they really are stressed about it. And I, and I can relate to that too, right? I think it, it's common and and many athletes will at, at some point experience, you know, that that disappointment as well as possibly an injury, possibly something that can really throw off their career. And and we saw this, I don't know if you saw this, but I, I had several athletes during the pandemic that really struggled when they really kind of identified as being an athlete and, and things really got shut down for a period of time. We saw a lot of depression and things like that. So whether you're being shut down for an injury or, you know, some something else. How do you advise parents to really um, help their children and effectively emotionally respond to that child, whether it's failure, injury, or having to come out of the sport for, you know, something like an eating disorder or some other maybe emotional or mental health related issue? Wow. I was having a whole bunch of thoughts in response to that. And I'll try and <laughs> try to keep track of them. Jackie sometimes <laughs> ask longer questions. Well, at least great. They're very reflective. I was thinking as you were talking, and there's injury, but I, I reflected on the pandemic. We had a few athletes in our area, and I don't want to make this sad, but they had passed away by suicide, and it was oh. during the pandemic. And yeah. they were really, really tied to you know, they, they, had a, they had a hard time because they felt like they were pot potentially going to lose um, opportunities and things like that. And it, you know, so often there's so much pressure on athletes to perform. And we've seen this time and time again, that when things happen like injury or even, you know, when they're, they're deciding to put their emotional health first and, and take a back seat, you know, <laughs> the world around them can, can come down pretty hard on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see. We've, we've got attunement and we've got uh, athlete identity in there uh, amongst other things and then dealing with injury and, and disappointment. So starting early on, and I, I like, I guess it's a metaphor, I like the notion of the safety net that mm -hmm. parents provide. And in the face of disappointment and, or injury, something like that, uh, and again, that could include things being shut down, uh, like as we experienced during the pandemic, I, I figure that parents can be a safety net and, and how they act as a safety net over the development of their youngster is going to naturally change over time. I really like what you said about, uh, in so many words, letting them fail. Mm -hmm. A colleague of mine uh, who's a, a very good coach uh, asked me about this years ago and I said, yeah, let them fail. Let them find out what it's like. Of course, when they're five years old, letting them fail mm -hmm. means one thing. Versus <laughs> when they're a 17-year-old athlete, letting them fail maybe means something else. And mm -hmm. at some point, the safety net lets them feel what the ground is like when they hit. And if they need a hand back up, it's still there, but it might be handed out differently. That sense of attunement, I think, has to do with being available for them. I like the concept of mirroring that uh, is used in uh, quite a few books about attachment theory and about emotional trauma and, and even parental absence. One example that I use with parents who are, you know, naturally, we're all concerned about the child's injury, you know, reacting to that kind of thing is tough on all of us. And we have stories in our family of orthopedic injuries that uh, I won't wade into and the reaction my wife and I had to those it'll take your breath away. So when I sit with parents and talk with them about that, I ask them to recall maybe the first, oh, skinned knee, uh, you know, the first uh, little cut, something like that in their youngster who is about as tall as their knee or something like that. Uh, they come to mom or dad with this owie. And it's devastating, of course, because if you're three or four or five or six or something, you know, that's, that's never happened before. And it's horrible. And I'll ask mom or dad to recall what it was like to respond to that and how they responded and how they looked and what they did and uh, how it turned out. And, you know, the classic story is 
oh my, look at this. Well, let's wash it. That might sting a little. And let's put a Band-Aid on it. Give them a pat, and they're back to playing. Parents typically can relate to something like that. Uh, if prompted, they can notice that they were pretty cool, calm, and collected, really. Uh, or that's, that's how they would like to be in a situation like that. And they can get back into that, mm -hmm. I found. Mm -hmm. And I ask them, what would happen if you brought that to the injury of your 17-year-old who just had an ACL tear? And we sit there for a few moments with that and consider, well, what's the impact on your youngster when you present that to them? I think they find that useful. And I think for many of us, you know, our child has this event uh, and they're distraught uh, and pausing for even a short moment and considering, well, what will we reflect back to them? Will it be more panic and distress? Or can it be an acknowledgement of the distress while we are maintaining our composure and considering, well, how do we best be there for them and help them through this and support them? Yeah. And it's interesting, as you were talking, I was thinking about so often, you know, whether my own children, when they were playing sports or, or kids I work with, 90% of the time, they're more worried about disappointing their coaches and their parents. And, oh, yeah. and they really they really look to the adults and I think we're, we're starting and we're trying to do a better job of really overall in sports, putting their emotional health and their physical health first. I mean, I, I remember I had a situation where a young player was, was injured and, you know, the coach had them keep playing and, you know, it ended up resulting in a, a lot bigger injury. And, and I also remember, you know, I've had conversations with coaches where they encourage athletes to really use their athletic trainer as opposed to going to the doctor. And, you know, we, we see it all, but really I think, you know, the, these kids, whether they're young or all the way through college age, I see this desire so much to please and, and really please others that when they are dealing with this, what I found helpful is for us to really still make them feel, you know, special or still make them feel like a star, even when they're not in that role. Because as we know, athletes, they get so much of that notoriety and so much of that praise for their sport, for their accomplishments. And when all of a sudden that's halted, how do they start to get that? You know, how do they still maintain that? And I find as as a parent and as someone coaching parents, we have to make sure that that our praise is not all of a sudden halted with that injury. Yeah, so, uh, excellent. So with that, I, I figure part of this from early on needs to be uh, needs to involve the notion that they're more than an athlete. Right. And uh, I'll I'll see. Uh, young athletes come in and, you know, they've had their injury and it seems like the world has ended, as you're describing. And when we talk and get into things, typically they have other interests. Uh, there are other things that they might be interested in pursuing. And as we talk about that and open it up, instead of, you know, life shrinking, there are aspects to life in my role. Part of my job is helping them see these other aspects of their life and helping life open back up so that it's larger than their role as an athlete because they're someone's friend and they may have many friendships. They may have a special relationship and they're someone's son or daughter. They're someone's student. Uh, yeah, they have a coaching relationship as well. They may be an employee at this point. They have many roles that they uh, act in and want to do well in. Uh, and that all leads to the possibility of, well, what's, what's important to you about those roles? What is it that you believe in that helps you pursue that? And then how would you go about showing that? You're injured right now, and there's no denying that that stinks. At the same time, how would you pursue acting in these other roles in a way that seems best to you and opening that up a little bit so that they can pursue that. And we know that athletes who, uh, you know, see themselves as, you know, I'm an athlete, I run this event and track and this event and track, and that's what I do, period. Athletes who see themselves only as athletes are more likely to choke. Mm -hmm. uh, athletes who 
uh, have a broader sense of themselves are less likely to do so. So from early on, parents, if we can help them, you know, be more than athletes, have, uh, you know, different academic interests, different extracurricular interests, read lots of books, whatever it is, and support that, great. And, and this, this actually goes along with literature on gifted kids. Mm -hmm. And I'll ask athletes sometimes, okay, so if there's a group of kids that were told you're absolutely gifted writers, uh, you know, whatever it is that you were born with is brilliant and you just you just know how to do this. And there, if there was a second group uh, that they were told, well, you work a lot on your writing. I can see that you put the effort into it, consider it, revise and, and redraft your writing. And it turns out beautifully. And if I ask an athlete, OK, so in a writing competition where there's national prizes at stake, which group feels the most pressure? And to a letter, they'll pretty much say, well, the group that was told that they were gifted. Right. right. We find that so often. That's so yeah. true. We once once you're true. identified as gifted or mm -hmm. talented or you've got mm -hmm. it or the thing right. or whatever, mm -hmm. if you're an athlete, man, you don't want to blow that because right. now you got to live up to it. Yeah. You know, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, that's the one thing that, you know, I think parents sometimes get a bad rap, but I think they do see their child that has a gift and they want their child to be able to experience the opportunities, you know, afforded to them with this gift that they have. And I think it can get very much a slippery slope in that. And that's what you're talking mm. about here. Yep. And and I don't think they're always trying to live their life through that. When I talk to parents, it's often as I want my child to receive what they should given what they have. And, and they will you know, receive so many opportunities given this, and, and I don't want them to miss it. And they operate out of that. They are gifted in yeah. whatever it may be. So so one approach I take to that, my wife has done, she's a fantastic mom, corporate lawyer, English teacher, law review editor. And so I get to bounce stuff off her all the time. It's brilliant. And I was having a bit of a rant one night and I said, you know, there's no such thing as talent. There's effort and choice. And that's the blunt rant. Sorry. <laughs> In talking with parents, I'll suggest to them that, well, whatever your child has, you know, we all have a genetic something, you know, there's a limitation. I am not going to be a super power lifter. That ain't going to happen. And I'm not going to be a world-class marathoner. I've got a certain physiognomy that's going to let me do okay with some things. I don't know where my limit is because I don't think I've really touched it. Fine. Many of us won't touch that genetic limit. Mm -hmm. But effort and choice mean just about everything. Mm -hmm. If our youngsters are making good choices and putting the effort into those choices, fantastic. We talk about, uh, you know, euphemisms like control the controllables and that sort of thing, which, you know, lost all meaning some time ago. If we can provide the environment where our kids want to make the right choice to pursue what they believe in, great. And that means that we provided a, uh, an environment where they feel cared about, where they feel like they're pretty good at what they're doing and like they've got a choice in it. And in our parents and coaches program that I mentioned before, we used to call it the three C's, caring, competence, and choice. And that comes from the environment we provide where we give them those things. Uh, and since we met, we're talking about attunement and attachment uh, before and being there with your child and providing them that mirror that is settling and reassuring to them. It sounds like a lot of pressure for mom and dad. Like, oh my gosh, I got to get this right. <laughs> uh, yeah. But the research on this from what I've seen shows that if we can maintain that attunement 30 to 50% of the time, it's going to work out. It's going to be okay. So we don't have to be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. And this is such a good conversation because I love what you said, because one of the things I do with parents is one of my first activities is I have them write down a, a few words, how they describe their child. And we talk about how our, the way we describe our child, you know, influences how we respond, you know, it all goes back to that mindset. So I love some of the stuff that you've said. Um, I know Robin in uh, closing loves to um, ask <laughs> one of three of her favorite questions. So I'm going to let Robin take it away. Okay. So Dr. Max, you can answer one, two, or three, whatever you want. But here are the three questions we ask all of our guests. One is tell us a funny parenting story. Two is what TV family or movie would you want to be a part of and why? 
And three is what does successful parenting mean to you? Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, well, I think we've been talking about successful parenting, and I, you know, yeah, and with that, uh, I was going to say that my a uh, a previous supervisor and colleague of mine, the late Bill Friedrich, said we parent in broad brushstrokes, and uh, another. Uh, now past colleague John Graff said they create us as much as we create them. So true. And I can't remember if John said it or if I added it on uh, if we let them. And uh, I can't think of a movie. I think I think I mentioned to you earlier. I can't think of a movie. And I I, I would say to my wife and my kids, I think I'm living it. <laughs> if there's a funny story there. Uh, you know, my wife was fond of telling the kids, don't do anything dangerous. And this would usually come up in the midst of a sword fight. <laughs> uh, swords, of course, be, can be made of many things, whether they're lightsabers or wrapping paper tubes or something else. Right. So years later for Mother's Day, they got her a card that they drew with stick figures with pirate hats on and swords where one is on a rolling chair leaning over it, fighting the other one with a sword. And uh, so don't do anything dangerous is, is kind of a... <laughs> famous phrase. I love it. Around here. I love it. Love it. Love it. Well, thank you so much. I love this conversation. We could go on for hours, but we need to wrap up. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It was, it was great. It was really helpful. And I think you do share, you know, I would love to have you at some point talk to our parents because I have so many high school athletes, you know, that I'm working with right now. And, and a lot of them, you know, were freshmen that went right into varsity sports and with the pandemic, you know, we've seen, they've lost a lot of ground. So there's so many parents out there just craving this information. So at some point, we're going to maybe revisit this conversation. Well, thank you both for having me. I, I enjoyed it. This was fun. Yeah. Thank you. Have an awesome day, everyone. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks, listeners. Thank you for joining us. And make sure to subscribe and like us to catch our next episode, where we will take you on a journey to find new ways of successful parenting.